we hear player concessions. We've always been talking about good faith concessions being made. And the immediate reaction that we hear from the league is, oh, we're actually going backward. How do you make sense of that? Well, you make sense of it from what I've kind of said all along. And I, I don't want to be redundant or repetitive, but it really does ring true. And it bears repeating that within the ownership group, <clears throat> there are factions and they are battling with each other and they are not aligned at all including surprisingly, maybe some teams like the angels or some larger market teams. Uh, you can see what the angels are worried about. If, if they voted no against the last proposal, the, or, the owners made, they're worried about the Dodgers. They're in LA. They're worried about the Dodgers and the runaway spending and the competitive, uh, you know, balance tax uh, in itself. Uh, the name of it's kind of uh, ironic as I think of it, but it was really meant to restrain salaries or to control rogue owners. It was geared towards George Steinbrenner back in the mid nineties is really what it, what it was pointed towards. And now you can say it's really geared towards the Dodgers and a new owner on the other side of town with the Mets, Steve Cohen. So yeah, that's what, that's what's going on now. The small market owners are battling with the large market owners and some of the middle market owners as well. And if you think about that last agreement that was offered by the owners to the players, the Tampa Bay Rays voted yes, supposedly, according to reporting, and, and the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim voted no. Really? I mean, that, that kind of shows you, you know, the, the battle that's going on in the ownership group. And it's a tough job for Rob Manfred, the commissioner. This is one time where I feel sympathy for him because he's got to align those factions and they all have diff different points of view, different objectives. It's a tough job, you know, without a doubt for him to try to get those, those guys all on one page. You have to remember eight owners out of the 30 can block any deal. If, if, if the, if they get a block of eight owners, you know, the angry eight can block anything. And from the latest offer we see from the players association uh, on Sunday, it was reported that they agreed in letting the commissioner to put in a couple of features that would obviously change the rules. And we're going to touch on this later in the episode, uh, a pitch clock larger bases, some shift restrictions as well. And it would allow the league to make the rule changes within 45 days of a proposal. James, were you surprised when you heard that they were, I don't want to say, I don't, I'm not sure if you're saying given, but conceding, right? We said good faith concessions. Were you surprised that the rule changes were, or I guess agreed to the, um, you know, the union agreed, I guess, to let that go, so to speak, over the weekend. Well, yes and no, because I could see it being lower down on the uh, pecking order for, you know, most important items. I think some of the financial uh, considerations are going to carry more weight there. But at the same time, I think the thing that caught my eye the most wasn't just necessarily all oh, rule changes, but the 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 forty five day rule. Uh, shortening the time for MLB to implement something that seems like a very uh, herky jerky sort of roller coaster kind of, kind of way to go about instituting a rule change. Now we don't know how this would actually go into effect say in 2023. I don't think does it MLB not going to go willy nilly changing all the rules left and right every 45 days, but just having that possibility is, is a little jarring. David, which concession point, whenever it comes from each side, do you think will be the one that breaks the dam here? Well, it's, I think it's obvious that, that the players have, have really, I think in my mind, come off a lot of their positions and, and, and made significant concessions towards the owners. And let me preface by saying I'm biased. I'm a former player, a former member of the Major League ba Baseball Players Association. I was on the executive subcommittee. I was the American League rep. So with that out of the way, let me just say, I feel like the players have come off of their, their, their points. They wanted to lower free agency from six years to five years. They came off of that point. They wanted to lower arbitration from three years to two years. I thought that was a very fair offer or very fair point to make. It was two years at one point. Historically, there is precedent for that on arbitration. After two years, the players association came off of that point. They do have a, a, an arbitration or a pre-arbitration pool in place now. I'll give the owner some credit on that side for agreeing to that, although it was a kind of a low number. But I really feel like the players are, have shown that they're willing to, to move towards the owners. I just think, just my gut feeling, that the narrative of the, the last couple of 
collective bargaining agreements on the player side was that they were soft. The players are soft. They're worried about extra seats on the bus. They want a chef in the kitchen, quality of life issues. They're not really worried about the core economic issues. They're kind of spoiled. We can break them. Well, that narrative has been proven false. The players definitely are solid. They've stuck together. They've proved to the ownership side necessarily so that they will stand up for what they feel is right. They will stand up for the next generation of players like every previous generation did for this current generation. So in that sense, I'm pretty proud. I'm pretty proud. You know, as I said, I'm biased. I'm pretty proud of the stance they took. I really feel like the owners were going to test them because the narrative was, is that these guys don't want to fight. They'll cave, they'll roll over. That narrative is now proven false on the players association side. And I say bravo to the players association. The seats on the bus narrative. They got that because that was all they could really get. Their proposals in those other negotiations included economic core issue topics, but they couldn't get the owners to move. So they took what they could get. Now there's more of a fight. And Coney, you mentioned this and I've seen some of the other players uh, mention this on social media, but just the, the larger idea of this is about the next generation of players. Coney, you've mentioned how short careers are. The average career might only be two, three, four years. A lot of guys don't even make it to arbitration. So a lot of these guys aren't even going to make it to the next CBA. So this is going to be the only CBA they play under. It's a great point. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, and, and then the narrative too, on the owner side, you know, with the use of advanced an analytics are exploiting that surplus value loophole, even more the service time manipulation on the minor league side, before they get to the big leagues, the shuttling up and down of pitchers in the bullpens, guys that pitch really well. How many times have we seen a reliever throw three or four really solid shutout innings? And his reward is, oh yeah, you're sent down to the minor leagues the next day. And that manipulates service time and affects their, their, their ability to actually negotiate a fair salary. That's all arbitration does is allow you to compare your with other, with other players in your category and get a somewhat fair salary. Otherwise it's a take it or leave it offer from the ownership side. And, and you know, whether you, maybe you get a little bit of bump from the minimum wage, but look at Aaron judge's career, uh, you know, in, in his first couple of years when he was under control until he can make it to arbitration, look at any, any other, the really young, great players uh you know, there's no leverage in your first three years until you can get to arbitration there's absolutely no leverage it's a take it or leave it scenario for the players we all know the the end game here is is the cbt threshold and there's a report from ken rosenthal that the league is willing to increase that the, the first cbt threshold from 220 million if the players union makes more concessions um they want the union to keep lowering that pre-arbitration bonus pool. And the players association is continuing to lower that ask. I mean, it was in the hundred million dollar range. Now it's down to 80. They also want to allow sharp penalties for teams who go over the threshold. And that's the sticking point right there, right? What a higher threshold, but a harsher punishment satisfy both sides. You think? It remains to be seen. You know, I, I think on the players association side, what they're going to look at is how it impacts a free market. And this is, this is the ironic part that we've mentioned before. And James and I kind of laugh about this and that the vast majority of owners have made their, their uh, fortunes as free enterprisers, free market capitalism, unrestricted, unfettered markets, uh, you know, uh, no welfare, no nothing. And then when they become owners of baseball, it's a reverse. It's the players who are arguing for somewhat of protecting somewhat of a free market. And it's the owners who are arguing just the opposite. No, we need restrictions. We need, uh, we need uh, revenue sharing. We, we need to uh, have regulations and bring everything down, sort of a drag on player salary. So, you know, I fi I've always found that ironic that the players are the ones that are fighting for a free market, but it's still not free completely. Uh, there's still restrictions on the market because of the competitive balance tax. So where that competitive balance tax hits really impacts the market at the top and the freer it is at the top, the more everybody else follows suit, not only the players and their compensation, but the owners as well. And don't think just because of two, that only two owners went over the competitive balance tax last year, that it didn't impact several others on, under them. It, it drags up probably at least 10 other ownership groups and teams and markets to, to kind of come up the ladder 
the higher the, the CBT is, the competitive balance tax is. It, it impacts more than two teams. The, the more strict penalties have dragged down salaries because when the luxury tax first started, it didn't really stop many teams from going over. Teams went over, they paid the penalty. What really hardened the cap, you know, the, the talk that, oh, well, it's sort of a soft cap and it's becoming harder. The thing that's doing that is harsher penalties, not just higher tax rates, but then you're adding non-monetary things like draft picks and being forced to give up draft picks. Those are the things that really made teams back off. And now you're getting that top level of the cap is becoming harder, closer to a, a strict cap. So I think the penalties is something to keep an eye on because if you raise the bar for the threshold, but make the penalties harder, then you're not really moving. Yeah. It's uh, it's no coincidence. We only had two teams in 2021 go over it, but if you take a closer look, there are about five or six teams that are hovering around the 5 million range, just under the threshold. So it's no coincidence with that.